this foundation for our guests and also about our graduate school of economics which is hosting this event about china and to remind all of us that we are actually as uh, having one of the commemorations of the 50th anniversary of our graduate school of economics in brazil in the Tupacas foundation first of all let me uh, say our very warm welcome to our guests uh, with the distinguished faculty from many different departments all over the world and also to thank professor uh, uh, who used to be professor of our school professor Castelo Branco which to this day we call him Roberto Castelo Branco as one of our professors although he is nowadays a director of Valley which is sponsoring this event and to which uh, we are also very thankful. I'd also like to thank Professor João Vitor Isler, who is with uh, Professor Castelo Branco, organizing and uh, giving all the technical details regarding the composition of the tables and the subjects to be discussed in the seminar. I will say some words about the foundation and about our school, and then afterwards I'll try to, to say some, make some parallels between China and Brazil that may orient the discussions to come this afternoon. So 68 years ago, in 1944, initially in July, by the, when the decree law has been issued, and then in December of 1944, when the, we had the first meeting of the General Assembly of this foundation, is where everything starts. So in 1944, the foundation started uh, as a center for the study of economics in Brazil. And to be very short about that, three main contributions of that time uh, have been the first set of national accounts in Brazil. National accounts were not uh, very old at that time. They have been devised and uh, actually first time presented as a, as a handbook many years later. But we did have uh, the, between 44 and 58 uh, and afterwards uh, 58 and 61, two different parts of the story of the history of our institution. Between 1944 and uh, 1958, we had the beginning of the national accounts of the measurement of price indices in Brazil and also of the statistics of the balance of payments. So this institution uh, in its inception has been responsible for this absolutely uh, important statistics that are used for macroeconomics in any country. In 1958, there was the idea, which actually actually repeated the idea of the creation of this foundation, which is the idea of preserving something. The foundation had been created in 1944 as a way to preserve what had been achieved by the government in terms of having an institution that would rationalize mostly at that time, the way how public employees, uh, prospective public employees would be selected from the candidates and also how they would be trained. So this is what actually was behind the foundation of this foundation in 1944, preserving that idea that we called here in Brazil the Instituto Daspi. And in 1958, there was the idea of preserving what that core of economics that had, had devised the national accounts, the, the price indices and the balance of payment statistics in Brazil, of preserving that, uh, that core of excellence and then the, the, our graduate school of economics was uh, started to be created and in 1961 for the first time we had the, our first class at that time, we were called CHI, cent uh, Center of uh, in, in Enforcement and of Enhancement of 
uh, economics in Brazil. And in 1966, we started to have the name that we carry nowadays, which is Graduate School of Economics of the Getúlio Vargas uh, Foundation. Many people have been responsible for that. I would just like to, to, to name some of them, the directors, uh, Professor Mário Henrique Simonsen, Professor Carlos Langoni, Professor Carlos Ivan Simonsen Leal, Professor Sérgio Ribeiro da Costa Verlan, Professor Clóvis Dalto Lira de Faro, and Professor Renato Fragelli Cardoso, who have been directors. And uh, it's a great honor for, for me to follow in their footsteps uh, as a dean of this school that has a very great tradition in Brazil. I must also remember uh, some, uh, at least two names uh, which are with us up to nowadays. Uh, which are senior professors of, at our school and which have been very much responsible for our academic achievements. And these are Fernando Holanda Barbosa, who is not here with us today, and Professor Haluizio Araújo, uh, also a member of the American Acad Academy of Science, and is us today here in this lunch. We have somehow achieved our mission, I would dare to say, by ranking first as uh, in the words of, of our Ministry of Education, the first school in Brazil, both in graduate and in undergraduate studies. So this is something that has been achieved through these 50 years of development, which dates back to 1961. Uh, we receive faculty from all over the world. I was here in the same place in December uh, of 2010, uh, when we had the financial economics in Rio, we were the leading scholars in finance from all over the world to, to come over here and say what they, how they were seeing the crisis, the Brazilian perspectives, and so on. So this, this is actually the second of, of uh, the events which are aimed at the co commemoration of our 50 years. Uh, as well as we receive invited guests from all over the world, our faculty, uh, actually only 19 faculty uh, in, uh, in the graduate uh, school and uh, some others uh, in teaching in undergraduate uh, are also usually invited to teach in different departments and uh, we also try to collaborate as much as we can for the formation of uh, Brazilian policy, macroeconomic policy, microeconomic policy uh, development of people who are going to somehow change this country and embrace the world's problems as our own. So this is, this is I think, the, the main uh, leitmotiv that leads us is enlarging human knowledge, thinking about innovations that can cure our problems, and being aware that we live in a world which is very much integrated and that we cannot look only to Brazil. And this event is a witness of this kind of thoughts that we have. I would say, I must say, and it's important to, to remember this at all times, that life in this foundation has not been as easy in terms of financial strength and uh, financial sustainability as it, it is nowadays. So we did have some problems uh, throughout this uh, 68 years and I'd like to, to, to say that uh, if we are here today uh, we must also thank uh, the leadership of our president Professor Carlos Iva who has under which we have uh, been able to see all those efforts which have been set forth in these 50 years, in these 68 years in, in terms of the foundation, to flourish as they were supposed to do at that time. So, l'argent, c'est le nerf de la guerre. So, uh, one would say in French, so we have achieved to, to manage this, this situation. Now, I would like to say some little words about Brazil and China and make some parallels. Well, in 1974, when Brazil reenacted its relations with, uh, with China, 
we were in a, in a period in Brazil when we had just managed to tame inflation between 1964 and 1966. Inflation, uh, if you measure the three first months of 1964 and extrapolated that to the whole year, it would get 144% a year of inflation, which at that time was a huge inflation. But in March, there was a change of policy, unfortunately by means of a dictatorship which uh, stayed in the government till 85 and we managed the inflation between 64 and 66 and between 67 and 73 we had a, a huge development of the Brazilian economy which somehow would resemble what we see right now in China so when I look at Brazil and China as a macroeconomist I see one similarity some things that sometimes are I could call qualitative differences and two big differences. So which would be the one similarity? I think the, the fact that, as Professor Shaw has said today, both China and Brazil, uh, China in 1979 and Brazil in 1968, were not at the technological frontier. So there was a catch-up that could be carried out at that time, and this catch-up could make things easier. Just by doing simple things, institutional development, such, such like taming inflation, having a good budget, so by doing these simple things, we have been able to grow very quickly without having to expand the technological frontier. So this is a similarity between Brazil and China. Nowadays, I think that in some areas, we are at the, at the verge of the, of, 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 of the knowledge, for instance, when in oil exploration, we cannot learn from the world. In some cases, the world has to, to learn from us. And, uh, but in most sectors, I, we are still in a, in a position that we can catch up and, and, and grow more quickly. And China is, is rich in this frontier uh, more quickly than we are. So we must probably be able to afford this catch up and this easy and easier growth than China for, for some time. Some points that are not difficult and not different, not equal, uh, I'd say, for instance, if you look at the doing business 2011, you're going to see that Brazil ranks before China in some, in some uh, points, in some items, and, and after China in some other points. For instance, if you want to, to open an enterprise, uh, it's easier in China than in Brazil. But if you want to close it, it's difficult, more difficult in Brazil than it is in China. Uh, regarding enforcement of contracts, for instance, it's, uh, China has uh, a better position than we do. So it's not only talking about human capital as Russia has shown to us. You may have thousands of PhDs, but if they do not have an environment that attracts them to be there, justice, uh, security, uh, health, education, sanitation, and so on, you may develop human capital, but this human capital may migrate to other countries, as I gave, have given the example of Russia. So it's important uh, not only to, to, to think about uh, the when we talk about the doing business 2011, that is a very important element because the third element I'm going to talk right now, uh, about which I'm going to talk right now, is which I, I said where the two big difference is exactly physical and human capital formation. So right now I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, how friendly is the environment for the purpose of growth, of entrepreneurship, and so on. So I'd say that in this regard, Brazil and China are not much different. Brazil is better in some uh, items, and China uh, better in some other items. Most, uh, although as a whole, this is statistic from the World Bank and the financial, International Financial Studies Institute uh, ranks China better than Brazil. And so wh which are the two big differences between China and Brazil that I see? Okay, you look at the PISA examination and you see China, China Shanghai being first in science, first in mathematics, first in capacity of expression, how people express. 
themselves. So that's amazing. And in this statistic, Brazil ranks like 53rd, 53rd, 57th. This is one big difference. And uh, when we look at what is happening right nowadays regarding, for instance, exchange rate and macroeconomic situation, we do fear a, 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 somehow the possibility of being facing a type of resource curse. You see that it is a very heat, heat, heated consumption, overconsumption of the government, overconsumption of the private sector, a huge amount of debt as a percentage of GDP compared to our history, although it's way lower than the United States. But you do see some symptoms that may uh, cause some concern. And what is the way to get away uh, from, from that? I mean, what is the way that we can uh, not be subject to this type of problem, like we call resource curse? Well, it's very simple. It's just training people, investing hugely in human capital and in education, so that these people, when the exchange rate is, uh, the price of, dollar, of the dollar is too low, and we have unemployment in some sectors, these people can be trained for the present and for the future, and by means of that, we can reallocate the absorption of labor. So this is the way how Botswana, for instance, in Africa, has had a trajectory completely different of Nigeria. They did faced the possibility of resource curse, but they invested so much from that money of the non-renewable resources which were being sold to the world at that time, they used that money to invest in human capital and they managed to get out of this dangerous trajectory that keeps the private sector away from the government and the government uh, has its revenues mostly based, based on non-renewable resources. So I think we have this challenge we are facing a $50 billion current account deficit at the same time that our terms of trade are very good. So what if they suddenly, uh, all of a sudden reverse? We have to be prepared for that. And the best way to be prepared is through the, the use of these resources for education, human capital, and having a business environment, a, 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 a justice, security, all these elements which are crucially determined by the action of the government, of a orthodox government, in, in such a way that we can make people under, uh, learn and want to stay here for production in, in Brazil. So this is the, the first big point of difference between Brazil and, and, and China. You see when you compare Brazil's ranking in the PISA, uh, it's just uh, an anecdotal evidence, and, and, and when you compare sh China, Shanghai, and Brazil, you see these discrepancies in the results. A second huge difference, which also differentiates Brazil, uh, China, and the United States, is the capacity to save, to save uh, in, regarding the government and regarding the private sector. So we uh, we have done great achievements since 1994 in education and in many areas, but we haven't yet managed to learn how to save more and invest more now in, in physical capital. So this is the, the other distinction. I remember when the United States in 74, when Nixon, President Nixon was very uh, weak at that time, they used that imbalance of power between the executive and the Congress in favor of the Congress to start the and the abolishment of the impoundment, something we call here in Brazil contingenciamento, which is something that by, a, by having the Congress approve a budget and the executive being allowed not to execute it, you severely hurt the balance between the executive and the, and the Congress. And they learned at that time in 1974 how to end up with that. We haven't learned this lesson yet. They created the Congressional Budget Office in the same year and we do not have yet in Brazil a organism which is able to forecast fiscal revenues, to forecast expenditures given some legislative measures which are approved by the Congress and so on. So 
this is something that some other countries have learned so back away in history, and we, we're still waiting for a political time that we can somehow improve the balance between the, 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 the Congress and the executive, which is nowadays is almost all executive and very little much of the Congress, exactly because of this impoundment policy that back there in the United States has been abolished in 1974. Another experience we could profit from is the idea what happens when you have huge government deficits and the exchange rate starts to be, the, the price of the, the, the foreign currency start to be lower and lower, and we start to fear about jobs being lost in the country and so on. Well, the same thing happened under the Reagan administration 1985, when the United States had a huge deficit of the government because it had decreased the taxes, but at the same time they had a, this, this huge twin deficit of the current account. How did they manage to get out of this? With a budgetary plan. They launched the Grand Hoodman Holdings Plan, 1985, which has not been well succeeded, but somehow has led to the success of the, of the administrations from 91 to, 90, to 98 and, uh, in the Clinton first and second terms. So knowing how to deal with the budget, the public budget, in order to enhance public savings, knowing how to make people see the future more than the present, to, to increase this relative preference of future over present and over past for the private sector in order to increase savings. This is something that we have not managed to understand. And I think we should learn with the Chinese how to do it and the rest of the world as well. I also think that if we look at the Chinese exchange rate and the, Chine and the Chinese look what we do with the exchange rate, these are two different uh, opposites. On the one hand, you have a, 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 a huge seven, eight hundred billion dollar surplus and people start to think, well, if we have to reduce that, Will we have enough domestic demand regarding investments and consumption if the rest of the world does not want us to be saving so much for them? So if they don't want us to have this huge superabit. And on the other hand, Brazil with a flexible exchange rate, which is uh, not working properly in order to guarantee a, 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 a current account that would be compatible with this favor favorable terms of, of trade that we have now is another polar. So actually, I think both countries have one to, to learn from the other. On the one hand, being in a flexible exchange rate, as somebody has uh, suggested today in the, in the, in the audience, uh, can lead to a valuation of the domestic exchange rate that can lead to problems in the long run. Not necessarily, but it, it may. On the other hand, having a too much developed exchange rate may lead to a problem when the rest of the world does not want to contribute so much in outsourcing demand for your country. So that's, uh, so these are dilemmas that I think that I don't know the answer to any one of these questions I'm posing, but I'm just trying to, 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 to sum up what I have learned from the, from the panels and, and, and to somehow to provoke the, the, the panels of this afternoon and, and, and of tomorrow. And one other thing, one last thing I'd like to say about uh, Brazil and China is that the amount of value added by human capital and capital in the exports we make to China is unfortunately still very low. Manufactured goods represent only 4% of our exports to China. When you compare to the United States or to Latin America, the numbers are much great, greater. So in Latin America, 76, and even the United States, 53% of manufactured goods. So does that mean that we should trade less with China? Of course not. It simply means that once more, we need to have the government reallocating people from, uh, from in, in order to enhance our productivity also in the manufactured goods, and little by little try to sell more goods which would have more value added in, in this thing. So this is also a provocation that, that to bring up this, this data about the little content of human capital 
uh, and and uh, physical capital in the exports we make to China. So once more, I'd like to 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 thank everybody for being here with us. Uh, we are going to have uh, some more panels this afternoon, and I hope uh, I have given I have seen some people at the table asking, but. Uh, when did the Getulio Vargas Foundation start? So I hope I have uh, answered, the, uh, given a, a, a clue about what the foundation represents to Brazil and what about our graduate school of economics represents to this foundation and to Brazil as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, after hearing uh, the lectures, the brilliant lectures of so many top economists, I feel myself in a similar, uh, uh, in a similar situation to the one that was experienced by the seventh husband of Elizabeth Taylor in the night, the, his first night with Miss Taylor. Uh, Everybody, he was fully aware uh, what's expected uh, to, uh, for him to, to, to do. And, but he had a big challenge to do something different. I, I'm going to try to do something different here. <laughs> well, in order to do that, I'm going to focus on the, one of the implications of the Chinese fast economic growth. It, uh, which is the impact on demand for commodities. Uh, so, um, I'm going to focus on the demand for minerals and metals, the class of commodities where, where for uh, my own professional duties, I'm less ignorant than energy or food. First, I uh, will uh, focus on the growth skepticism because it has some implications uh, on the on capital markets as is uh, one of the source of volatility in global capital market. And it's part of me, my daily experience. I have been uh, interacting with investors all around the globe, and particularly in this side of the Atlantic, in North America and Brazil, I have uh, perceived a lot of skepticism uh, about Chinese economic growth. And second, uh, I'll focus on the Chinese role in the demand for, uh, for, for metals. And uh, of course, I'll take the opportunity to uh, tell you something about Bali, given the fact that we uh, have been a large player in this market and a large player in the supply of raw materials to China. And uh, finally, I will uh, make some comments about uh, commodity exporters and economic development. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, comparative advantages, exploitation of competitive advantages, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, focus on high-value-added products in Brazil, uh, suffered a revival from the old debate that uh, started to, to, play, to take place in this country, involved Eugenio Goudin, who is the founding father of uh, the tradition of Getulio Vargas Foundation in economics, and the Sao Paulo industrialist, Roberto Simonsen, and later with Raul Pebrich, uh, the Argentine economist from the UN Economic Commission for Latin America, uh, Mr. Prebich had a very interesting thesis about the continuous deterioration of terms of trade, uh, which was the intellectual foundation for the adoption uh, in Latin America, in large scale, of uh, import substitution and industrialization at any cost, which generated a major misallocation of resource and uh, uh, was on the main problems of Latin American economies for uh, several decades. Well, uh, according to the data uh, produced by the late economic historian 
Angus Madison, uh, developed economies grew at an average uh, annual rate of 1.3% uh, over a long period of time, from 1820 to 1950. This was completely different from the uh, accelerated growth rates of uh, some Asian economies, starting with Japan from uh, 1950 onwards, from the Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, and Taiwan from the mid-60s, and from China in the, uh, starting from the late 70s. And as a result of that, the expansion multiples during this relatively short period of time, and take only 30 years uh, from the start of accelerated growth. Uh, China, as uh, Pedro Cavalcanti mentioned, is a unique case of economic development, of fast growth. Uh, the real per capita GDP of China, by the end of the period, that's uh, 2007, was 12.5 times uh, the size of real per capita GDP at the beginning of the period of this period in 1978. This was more than twice uh, the expansion multiple for developed economies in a uh, much uh, a longer period of time, 130 years. And this uh, contrast in uh, growth rates led to uh, a lot of skepticism. Initially, most of Americans and European economies thought that it was not sustainable. It was occurring due to something uh, by a fluke. And uh, uh, one of the, the main uh, challenges to, this, uh, to, to the sustainability of, uh, of long-term growth by Asian economies was launched by uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Krugman, his 1994 paper, The Myth of uh, Asian Miracle. By the way, uh, I don't like this expression of miracle because there are no miracles in economics. It's totally inconsistent, inconsistent with uh, the famous and uh, widely recognized and accepted uh, uh, statement by Professor Milton Friedman that there is no such a thing as a free lunch, even in France. And uh, the, 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 the reason for, for the, 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 the accelerated growth of uh, Asian economies, according to Paul Krugman, was only uh, investment capital. And according to him, uh, very soon uh, Asian economies will enter into a phase of diminishing returns. And then it will lead to stagnation. But uh, with the benefit of hindsight, he was wrong. Uh, it was not that simple. Uh, that stage of diminishing returns didn't show up. And why is that? Because these economies prepared to grow. Uh, they made uh, several uh, reforms involving privatization, deregulation, giving uh, a larger, role, larger room for the price mechanism to uh, develop its role in the allocation of resource. Uh, they changed the, the, the improved the macroeconomic policy framework, open uh, the, 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 the open themselves for trade and at least partially for international capital flows. And last but not least, they invested very significant amount of resource and continue to invest in human capital. Uh, the case of China that I'm going to focus, uh, particularly in the high school, colleges, and universities, there was a very significant increase in enrollment, enrollment rates. In terms of illiteracy, uh, there was a dramatic reduction of uh, illiteracy rates from uh, 1980, when it was 34.5% uh, of the population uh, 
above 15 years of age uh, to only 6.3% in 2008. It was much more important if you look at the illiteracy rate for the young generation, for people from 15 to 24 years. It's only in 2008, it's only 0.7%. Uh, almost zero. Uh, in terms of quality, uh, according to the program for international student assessment, in, uh, do the tests uh, uh, run in 2009, uh, Chinese students from Shanghai were number one in terms of reading, math, and science. So this tells us that uh, uh, economic growth is not taking place by a fluke, or it's, going to, or it's subject to a sudden stop due to the uh, reduction in the marginal productivity of capital. And uh, there are many uh, exercises of growth accounting showing that the total factor productivity was an important contributor, contrib contributor for long-term economic growth. So there is sustainability in Chinese economic growth. And this skepticism uh, led the, uh, several economists to, uh, to miss the, the perception of, uh, of a, a very important structural shift in the global economy. And it has been the source of volatility in global capital markets. Uh, I have some anecdotal uh, evidence uh, of, uh, I remember 10 years ago, that people, uh, uh, some people launched the, uh, the hypothesis that uh, Chinese economic growth was only due to the Olympic Games. And uh, so how can this happen? It will be unique in, in economic history. A country investing a massive amount of resource, making s deep reforms just for an event in a city that will last for less than one month. Uh, I have been hearing from investors every year, uh, there is a property bubble in China, there is a banking crisis, uh, there will be a hard landing in China. Things that never materialize uh, and things that is not supported by theory and by empirical evidence. Well, let's move to uh, metals markets. First, Vale was incorporated in 1942, rem remained as a state-owned company for 54 years. It was privatized in May 1997. It was a mid-sized mining company with all assets, operations in Brazil, it has only four offices uh, uh, out of Brazil, in Shanghai, Tokyo, uh, New York and Brussels, and did not even appear in this uh, ranking uh, made annually by the Financial Times, the Global 500, F FT 500, the 500 uh, bigger uh, companies by market capitalization. The first year we uh, entered into this uh, ranking, it was in 2002, uh, number 446. And more recently, we are among the 20 largest companies in the world by market capitalization. The Vale is now, since 2007, world's second largest mining company by market capitalization. And from a typical Brazilian exporter, we evolved into being a large global company with offices and operations in all continents, from Canada to New Caledonia, in the South Pacific, from Argentina to uh, Liaoning in China, and from Brazil to Norway and Africa. And uh, I used to say that we are the most Asian of the Latin American companies, because 20% of our assets are in uh, Asia. We have uh, operations uh, throughout the Asia Pacific from New Caledonia to China, Australia, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, now Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, uh, some 
mineral exploration, the Philippines, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and China. And uh, the Asian market has been increasingly important to us. We started to sell uh, to Asia back in 1955, and now it's, it's our main market by far, by far, and it tends to become even more important in the future. China, 10 years, 80 years ago, represented only the source of uh, 7% of our sales. Now is one third of our sales, and the, the, the Asian region as a whole represents more than half of our sales. And last but not least, we are the only company in the Americas listed in a major Asian uh, uh, stock exchange in Hong Kong. Uh, so with these uh, value shares are traded almost around the clock. We have 20 hours of trade in 24 hours per day. Well, shifting to specifically to metals, uh, China has a very high uh, intensity in the consumption of steel measured by uh, tons per unit of GDP. Uh, comparing with the United States since the early 20th century, it has been uh, about 30 to 40 percent higher than the peak level of the U.S. that was reached in 1917. Yeah. And what is the reason for that? Well, first, the Chinese economy is growing much faster uh, than the U.S. economy was grown at that time. But second, there are some structural characteristics. Yesterday, John Anderson focused on the, the very high, very large investments in China in the, in, the, in the real estate sector. And secondly, uh, the, the construction in China is very intensive in metals. It's completely different from Brazil and the US. And third, China has a very big uh, manufacturing industry uh, relatively to the size of its economy. It's much bigger than the size of Brazilian manufacturing industry or Indian manufacturing industry. Uh, it as a share of GDP is almost 50 percent. In the case of Brazil, India is around 20, 25 percent. So it's highly intensive in the consumption of metals, particularly steel. And if you shift to base metals such as copper and nickel, uh, the Chinese intensity in the consumption of uh, these uh, base metals, and you you, you can these just two examples. You can uh, move to uh, aluminum, zinc, and others, uh, you, you are going to find the same, the same landscape with Chinese intensity surpassing the intensity in developed economies and being much higher than then now. Well, as a consequence, uh, China became number one consumption of metals and iron ore uh, by far with the uh, the Chinese consumption of, uh, of steel is almost half of global consumption. The case of iron ore is higher than 60% of the global consumption. And as a consequence of that, uh, we have seen a significant impact of price because China has uh, some natural resource endowment. It's much better than Japan that has no uh, practically no natural resource, but is not uh, uh, sufficient in terms of quantity and quality to sustain its, uh, its uh, very uh, rapid growth, is not uh, uh, sufficient to sustain a huge real estate sector, a very large uh, manufacturing industry. So it became, uh, uh, at the same time, the largest importer of many of the metals. And there was a very significant impact on the, on the, the price of uh, base metals. Uh, you can see here the effect of the, the Great Recession of 2008 and uh, the uh, V-shaped recovery um, according, exactly according to the Zarnowitz rule. Uh, the deeper the recession, the stronger the recovery. That's exactly what happened 
with the price of metals. Uh, it was the faster recovery from any recession, at least since 1970. Uh, for iron ore, that's our main product, uh, we made some exercise uh, isolating the long term from seasonal uh, fluctuations and cyclical fluctuations. Uh, our senior econometrician, uh, Claudia Rodriguez, used the NASIMED filter, uh, the CF filter, in order to uh, isolate a long-term trend. You are going to see a long-term trend in real price of iron ore, reflecting the fact that uh, iron ore, as any other mineral, is a non-renewable resource. And uh, uh, unless there is a discovery of new reserves, of new high-quality reserves, uh, this trend will continue over time. Uh, not, of course, not forever, because there will be all discoveries or technological change that will deal with this. But we are going to see this trend evolving for during some time in the future. Well, uh, as I said, uh, China lacks uh, uh, an endowment of natural resource of mineral deposits in order to to deal with uh, an, an option to, to offset the, 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 the poor uh, endowment of, this was the experience of Japan in the 50s to, to the 70s. Uh, at that time, uh, we lived in a different world. There was no global capital markets, and Japan was hungry for raw, material, raw materials, and at the same time, uh, it was capital rich. So the Japanese used the, uh, the trading companies, which are uh, private sector companies, and the financing of official credit institutions to buy assets and to develop projects around the world. Uh, in our case, for instance, we developed Carajais, that's a major uh, margin, at a time when Brazil had no access to financial markets because we declared moratorium in the early 80s. And so the Japanese came and provided the financing, uh, long-term financing in exchange for long-term contracts. And we have, till today, we have several JVs with the Japanese here in Brazil, in Indonesia, New Caledonia, and other places in the world. We have a very one of the the, the, our important shareholders is Mitsui from Japan, is an inheritance from that time. And what's the difference now? We have global financial markets. Uh, we have plenty of access to global financial markets. We don't need a specific financier. The Japanese were the financiers of projects. And uh, we have different models. Uh, the Japanese followed the model with private sector entities and uh, credit supply was provided by official credit institutions. And the Chinese uh, have a state-owned model. Uh, the investors are state-owned companies. This generates opposition from governments for the countries, uh, from the societies of the countries that the Chinese are trying to acquire assets and sometimes they fail. And last but not least, the Japanese investment in mining assets was not sufficient to change the long-term trend. Uh, there was the, the trend, the, the long cycle uh, uh, generated by, of, of uh, minerals and metals, generated by uh, Japanese economic growth, came to an end with Japan uh, started to stagnate. That happened after the first oil shock that, uh, the, in 1973. There was a deceleration in global economic growth. The Japanese economy, which was, was the, the main driver of growth, uh, entered into a phase of much more moderated growth. And so the, on the demand side, there was the, 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 uh, a similar strength uh, that we had seen in the 50s and the 60s. So the long cycle came to an end. And, but in the world, there is a, still a place which has no 
uh, large access to global financial markets and it uh, needs capital. That's Africa. Africa, at the same time, is the new mining frontier. Uh, the, 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 the countries rich in natural resources, such as Canada, Chile, Australia, Brazil, uh, South Africa, uh, have been extensively mapped by the investment in mineral exploration. Uh, Africa is, is still virgin and does not have access to global financial markets. And so Africa it now is the, at the same time the mining frontier and the battleground between Western mining companies and Chinese companies. The Chinese are investing extensively in infrastructure and uh, we are building an asset base in China, not in, in Africa. In order to do that, we are following the same pattern. We have to build everything from scratch, railroads, ports, in order to have access to the very good, to the world-class uh, mining assets in, in Africa. Well, last part of my presentation, the, uh, these uh, Chinese growth, very uh, strong Chinese growth over time, has been benefiting the natural resource producers. And Brazil is a global powerhouse of natural resource. And uh, as a consequence, our terms of trade have been uh, uh, going up. There was significant uh, gains of terms of trade. Uh, the hypothesis of, uh, of how, how published does not go well with the data. And uh, instead of having uh, a declining trend in terms of trade, at least for some years, they have been increasing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a little paradoxical because uh, this hypothesis of, uh, of deterioration in terms of trade was uh, uh, supported, heavily supported by leftist economies, economies in Latin America. And it was a communist country that provided the, the counter evidence. <laughs> and uh, the gains of trade of, in terms of trade uh, they uh, uh, allow Brazil to uh, invest more without sacrificing, sacrificing consumption. Uh, that's very good for the country. Although uh, sometimes neither politicians or some economists do not understand quite well this. And as a consequence, uh, there is a new debate. Some politicians or some leftist economists they argue that uh, Brazil should uh, export value -add, high value added products. Why Valley uh, concentrates on white and ore? Why Valley does not produce steel? Uh, I argue that why Valley does not produce, instead of steel, uh, uh, space, uh, spacecraft or new electric vehicles. So let's go for high tech, not just steel. Steel is a commodity. Uh, but uh, sometimes the focus on value-added products led to value-destruction products. Uh, and uh, there is a hypothesis, oh, there is the natural resource cost. Uh, uh, countries that focus on the exploitation of comparative advantage uh, in natural resource are doomed to be poor. There is the natural resource curse. But there are some uh, uh, natural resource rich countries that are developed countries. There are some uh, of, the, of the, the, the commodity exporters that are rich countries. And the first one is the United States. It's a very large export of commodities, although given the size and the sophistication of the American economy, uh, commodity exports are not important as a share of GDP. But let's shift to other countries, to other smaller economies such as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Norway, and even Chile. Uh, they, in their, these countries, commodity exports are important in terms of shares of GDP. For Australia, 13%. For Canada, about the same. For Norway, almost 25%. Uh, for Chile, that's, uh, uh, it's near the threshold of becoming a developed economy. Commodities are very important. And, this, and Brazil, 
uh, commodity exports are much less important. Brazil, in terms of commodity exports, is more similar to the US than to Chile or Australia or Canada. And uh, this, all this discussion about uh, the, 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 the exports of commodities, all this call for exporting value-added products that people that does not want to, to exploit competitive advantage. And uh, here, uh, based well, looking at Chile, I uh, 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 get some uh, uh, some uh, 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 some list that, of course, is not extensive of uh, policies that should be uh, followed in order to uh, uh, to let natural resource to cause positive effects on long-term economic growth. First one is invest in human capital. Second, invest in infrastructure. Uh, quality of institutions is also an important factor to develop institutions that uh, uh, are in, uh, uh, proven uh, 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 to lead to less corruption, to eliminate corruption, for instance to use policies that are stimulative of private sector investment. For instance, not uh, use export tax. Argentina is a champion of export taxes. And Argentina is the opposite example of Chile. Is uh, the one who didn't follow this list of, uh, of recommendations. To use a flexible exchange rate regime to smooth the, the impact of shocks and to use counter-cyclical fiscal policies. On the contrary, uh, several countries use pro-cyclical uh, and continue to use pro-cyclical uh, fiscal policies. So this, as I said, is not an extensive list of recommendations. This is only based on my observation on Chile against Argentina, against Brazil, that at least Chile is the best economy in Latin America, it's the one that uh, uh, has been growing consistently over time. There was some uh, um, some decline in the in total uh, factor productivity growth over the the the, the 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 most recent period, and I believe that this will be reverted from now uh, on. Uh, in the in particular in the in the government of Michel Bachelet, uh, the the performance of productivity was very poor but now is improving again. So, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take your questions.